We're back. I'm going to take a look at another one of my commander decks. This time it's uh, Tristani Selesnian's Voice. This one's basically a massive token production deck. You get a ton of creatures out into play and then just overwhelm your opponents. To give you kind of an idea, this is actually the uh, stack of tokens. There's two of each here, so it's a little bit less than it looks, but these are the tokens that the deck can produce, so... Lots and lots of tokens in there. Anyway, we'll get right in and uh, take a look. So for our mana base here, we start off with our basic lands. We've got uh, 25 basic lands, pretty much half and half uh, forests and plains. Because this is my uh, probably my second favorite deck, aside from Omnath, I did put a little bit of work into this and all of them are full art lands just because I think they look cool. Yeah, so we have our uh, 13 forests out of there and 12 plains. For non-basic lands, we start off with Kroos and Verge. This one comes into play tap, which kind of sucks, but it taps for a colorless, and then in for two, you can tap it, and you can go get a plains and a forest. Next, we have Grove of the Guardian. Taps for colorless. For three, a green and a white, you tap it and sack it, and it turns into an 8-8 eight, eight green and white elemental uh, token with vigilance. Comes into play with a lot of the populate and other token doubling things that we have in this deck to uh, build it up. Next we have a Selesnian Sanctuary. It's another one that comes into the battlefield tap, but I really like that this one has the uh, ability that it taps for both a green and a white. The downside is you have to return a land to your hand when you play it, but you can uh, always return a tapped land to your hand, and then you have land to play next turn, so it's not that big of a deal. Next we have Temple Garden. Taps for green or white. Enters the battlefield tapped unless you pay two life. So... If you're up on life, you can spend the two and have it come in untapped, which in a 40 life format really isn't that bad. Next, we have Grey Pelt Refuge. So the one that enters the battlefield tapped, but you gain a life when it comes into play, and it taps for green and white. Sun Petal Grove, another land that taps for green or white, comes into play tapped unless you already have a forest or plains. So basically, you make it the second land you play in the game, and no worries there. Next, we have Selesnya Guildgate. Another comes into play tap, taps for green or white. Command Tower, really nice. If you're playing anything multicolored as a commander, it's nice to pick these up. They're pretty cheap. Any of the commander pre-built decks come with them, so they're, they're pretty common nowadays. But taps for any color your commander uh, needs. Next we have Amira the Sky Ruin. This one I, I started liking after I made a mono white deck and kind of started throwing in anything that runs enough planes to trigger it. Comes in the battlefield, taps, taps for a white, and uh, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you have seven or more planes, then you can return target creature cards from your graveyard to the battlefield every turn without paying costs, which is just really nice to have. And when we're running 12 planes in here, it's pretty easy to get seven on the field. And last, we have Gabony Township, taps for a colorless, for two, a green and a white, you tap it, and you can put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control with the amount of token creatures doubling and population in this deck that comes into play you can really make all those little tokens huge for our spell cards you start off with uh, doubling season if you're running a token deck or anything that uses counters and you're not running this it's kinda silly it also plays really well with uh, planeswalkers don't think there's any in the deck anymore but uh has lots of uses. Anything that gives us those plus one, plus one counters are going to be doubled. Any of those tokens are going to be doubled, and so on. This one's even autographed by the artist. Next, we have Elixir of Immortality. Again, it's pretty much a staple in Commander decks. Let you uh, Not only do you get to gain the five life, but you get to shuffle your graveyard back into your library. Luminarch's Ascension. This one uh, is really cheap to throw out for two mana. And that ability that at the uh, end of each opponent's turn... If you didn't lose any life, you put a counter on there. Once you get uh, four or more counters on there, you can pay two mana to get a 4-4 Flying Angel. If it goes around once and three of the players don't attack, so you don't lose any life, right there is three of the four counters you need. So ramps up really quickly, though it does kind of make you a target because people are liable to start attacking you, even if they originally weren't planning on, just so you can't build up the tokens. Next we have Phyrexian Rebirth. 
It's one of our board wipes. This destroys all creatures. And then you get XX colorless horror artifact creatures where X is the number of creatures that were destroyed. Basically lets you wipe the board of creatures and then using doubling season, parallel lives and things like that in this deck, you get to put out a ton of tokens and basically gives you uh, control of the board. Next we have Swiftfoot Boots. Pretty much another staple in uh, Commander. That uh, haste and hexproof. Next we have Austeri Command. This one's an interesting one. You get to choose two. Destroy all artifacts. Destroy all enchantments. Destroy all creatures with a converted mana cost of three or less. And destroy all creatures with a converted mana cost of four or greater. You pick two of those. Gives you some control over what's on the board. Let you wipe out either some really large creatures. And you get to keep your tokens and things like that. Just nice to have options. Next up we have Asceticism. Pretty much a must have I think if you're running green. I have it in almost all of my green decks. I think I'm missing it in my Dragon Jun deck because I haven't gotten another copy yet. But creatures you control can't be the targets of spells and abilities your opponents control. Basically gives all of your creatures hexproof. And then you have that uh, pay one and a green to regenerate target creature on top of that. Comes in really handy. Next we have Beacon of Creation. This one's kind of a, a fun one. It puts a 1-1 green insect token into play for each forest you control. And then it reshuffles into your library. So it's reusable. 1-1s aren't that great. The fact that we're only running half of our lands as forests kind of hurts it a little. It's better than a mono green. But in this case, with all of our doubling of the tokens and things, anything that puts out more tokens is welcome. And the fact that it's reusable definitely makes it a nice addition. Next we have Beastmaster's Ascension. This one I love, especially in decks that have small, uh, expendable creatures. Whenever a creature you control attacks, you put a quest counter on there. As soon as there's seven or more quest counters on there, all your creatures get plus five, plus five. Suddenly those little zero one plant tokens or one one sapperlings uh, become huge threats. It's just a nice thing all around if you can get it to trigger. Next we have Intangible Virtue. This one uh, gives all your creature uh, tokens plus one, plus one in Vigilance. With the amount of tokens we're running in this deck, giving them all Vigilance just makes them really uh, interesting, especially combined with like Beastmaster's Ascension. Now you can attack with all those little tiny 1-1s, one get the tokens to crank that up, and they're still available for defenders. Parallel Lives is the second of our uh, token defenders. Like Doubling Season, this one lets you put out an uh, extra token for every token you would normally put in play. This one doesn't affect the plus one plus one counters like that does, but it's also uh, a little bit uh, cheaper to cast and uh, doesn't draw quite as much attention when it's out. Next we have Skull Clamp. This is there basically to get us some card draw. With all those small 1-1s one and 0-1 creatures out there, you equip this on there, it gives them plus one, negative one, and when they die you get to draw a card. So you put it on one of those with only one defense, they die immediately, you get to draw a card. For one mana, you can keep doing that, keep throwing it on those tokens and keep drawing cards. And get rid of a bunch of sacrificial guys in return for refilling your hand when you need it. Next we have White Sun Zenith. I'm a big fan of the Zenith cards in pretty much any of my commander decks. They all do interesting things. This one especially fits because it puts out uh, token creatures. Um, it's three white and an X. X gives you that many 2-2 two -two creatures. And then you uh, shuffle it back into your library, which is most of the reason I like them, because they're reusable. Ghostly Prison was something I just kind of found one day, and it just fits so perfectly in Commander decks. I think all my white decks now run it. Creatures uh, can't attack you unless their controller pays an extra two mana per creature they want to attack. Really slows people down early on, and even late game you're not going to get hit with big swarms of things. They really have to pick and choose what they're going to attack with. Soul Foundry is one that's kind of a hit or miss. It's, it's on the uh, cut board since there's a couple other cards in here that pretty much serve the same purpose. This one you actually have to take a card out of your hand and exile it, which is why it's going to get cut, I think, because I don't like doing that. But you imprint the card that you exile onto it, and then you can pay the mana cost of that creature. You tap this, and you put a copy out that's a token of that creature. The nice thing about these is they stay in play where things like Mimic Vat and... I can't remember what the other one is that's in here, but uh, they go away at the end of the turn. These stay in play, so you can kind of build up, which is nice about it. The really big thing for this is you put something that has a enter the battlefield ability like the Avenger of Zendikar, who puts out a ton of tokens when he enters the battlefield. And now for his mana cost, 
you tap this artifact every turn, pay that cost, and you're going to put out another copy of him, and it's just going to put out tokens exponentially. Next we have Growing Ranks. In a token deck, it's pretty nice. It's a little slow compared to most things, but let you populate at the beginning of your upkeep every turn. It's nice for an enchantment that's going to stay out, and as soon as you have any sort of tokens on the board, you can start making use of it. And when you get some of the bigger tokens that this deck can put out, then it really starts to become useful and shine. Next we have the Mimic Vat. I talked about that earlier. It's another imprint uh, card. This time, whenever a creature goes to the battlefield, you may imprint it on here. And then for three mana, you tap this. You put a copy of that into the uh, onto the battlefield. And then that copy's exiled at the end step. Not quite as useful as the uh, Soul Foundry, but at the same time, you can use it on opponent's creatures and things that aren't even in your color wheel and uh, really bring back some interesting things depending on what your opponents have. I also like the fact that throughout the game, whenever something goes to the graveyard, you can change what's imprinted on it. So it gives you a little more options and variety as better things might come up later on that weren't available at the time. Next we have Privileged Position. This one's kind of our uh, part of our protection package. Other permanents you control can't be the targets of spells or abilities your opponents control. Basically gives all of your permanents hexproof except for it itself, which does make it a target, but there's other ways we have in here to protect this. This combined with asceticism is a really nice combo. Next we have True Conviction. Nice staple card to have in anything that's running massive amounts of smaller creatures. It gives everybody the double strike and lifelink. Pretty much makes those smaller creatures into something more to be feared, especially when we're putting all the, the uh, plus one counters on them from all our various other upgrades. Giving them double strike is bad enough. Giving them lifelink is just kind of icing on top of that. Crush of Worms is a card I've contemplated cutting out of this deck so many times. But when you do get it off, it just makes it worth it and you feel like you, you have to keep it in there. It's an extremely high mana costing card at, at 9 mana. It gives you 3 six, six Worms. And it also has a flashback cost of uh, 12. And it gives you another 3 if you use it for that. With all of our doubling season parallel lives and whatnot in play, you get a massive amount of really big tokens. The drawback is they don't have Trample. If they had Trample, I wouldn't even debate it. But every now and then I, I get new cards that I want to add. This is one of the ones I look at cutting. Because if you draw it early on in the game, it's a dead card in your hand for God knows how long. Until you can get up to 9 mana to even make use of it. That triple green doesn't help too much either when we're running a double colored deck. We do have a lot of dual producing lands though. So it kind of helps. Aura Shards is another pretty much staple. If you're running green and white, you should have this in your deck. If you run anything that runs tokens or lots of small creatures, you should have this in your deck. It's uh, basically our biggest removal tool in here. Whenever a creature comes into play under your control, you can destroy target artifact or enchantment. Awakening Zone is another one that's kind of slow for the deck, but it gradually builds up its usefulness as time goes on. At the beginning of your upkeep, it gives you a 0-1 Eldrazi spawn creature, which aren't that great, and one a turn isn't a huge help. With our doubling token cards that we have, you start putting out multiples of them. The real use is that they can be sacked for colorless mana. So early on in the game, especially if you have one of the doublers in play, you're going to be getting these tokens every turn that you can sack for extra mana to cast some of your bigger stuff earlier on. Next we have Hour of Reckoning. It's another expensive casting cost spell but this is another one of our board wipe ones really nice thing about this one is that uh, it has convoke so you can tap creatures to uh, reduce the casting cost which really is nice with a bunch of our tokens we can just tap a bunch of tokens and make this thing practically cost nothing and uh, this one destroys all non-token creatures so honestly if you're going to do that anyway you probably want to tap your regular creatures keep the tokens and then when all your regular creatures are tapped, you play the card, you destroy them anyway. It's no big loss. Nomad's Assembly is another mass token producer. This one gives you a 1-1 one, one white core soldier for each creature you control. And it has rebound. It's got a moderately high casting cost of 6. But the fact that it goes off twice and the fact that the, the rebound is what really sells it because you're going to double the number of creatures you have in play because you're going to put out these tokens. 
and then on your next turn it plays again so you're going to double that number again so in the end you're getting four times pretty much what you had on the table really makes up for its casting cost riptide replicator is a card i pretty much discovered when i was building a sliver commander deck way back before it was even called commander and uh, it's an interesting card four mana and x and you claim a color and creature type when you play it the Replicator uh, comes into play with the X amount of charges on it, and then anytime you pay four, you tap it, and you put an XX creature of the type and color you said onto the battlefield. Interesting little thing. If you got a little bit of mana, you can throw it out there and make smaller guys. It's really more useful if you have a ton of mana, you can dump it into there, and then for four mana, you're just putting out these huge ungodly token creatures every turn. Well of Lost Dreams is pretty much in here for uh, more card draw. Our commander lets us uh, gain life a lot. We have a bunch of cards in here with lifelink. There's ways to give other creatures lifelink and things like that in the deck. Whenever you gain life, you pay X, where X is equal, or, uh, equal to or less than the number of life you gained, and then you draw that many cards. You could pay one mana if you got it floating around to draw a card every time you gain life, or if you gain a big chunk of life at once, you can draw as many cards as you really need to as long as you have the mana for it. Helps you keep your hand full, have those options to cast. Fresh Meat's a really nice card. It combos very well with a couple of our board wipes. This lets you put a 3-3 beast creature onto the battlefield. For each creature that was put into your graveyard from the battlefield this turn, you play a board wipe, you wipe the board, you play this, you get all your creatures back. Everybody else has nothing. Kind of nice. You, you do only get the little 3-3 vanilla beast, but still, it, it is a nice way to recover from that kind of thing. Next we have Cathar's Crusade. This is one of my favorite enchantments in the deck. Uh, whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you get a plus one, plus one counter on each other, uh, each creature you control. And basically with the amount of creatures we're going to be dropping through sorcery spells that summon multiple creatures through our doubling season, through our parallel lives, and our populate abilities, you're going to be putting so many creatures on the battlefield that I actually had to go out and buy an extra dice cube worth of uh, mini dice so I could keep track of the counters. It gets really crazy later on in the game, and you have so many tokens on so many of your creatures. It does get a little confusing and hard to keep track of, but usually by that point, your opponents are seeing what you're doing, and they pretty much just give up. Next, we have the Chromatic Lantern. This one lets your lands uh, tap for any color that you want. It also taps for any color you want. Really nice in a multicolor deck. Not as useful in a dual color deck as it would be in something with three or five colors. But uh, works here because it lets you uh, pretty much mana fix. Say you're, you're getting yourself screwed and only drawing forests and you need those planes. Three mana, slap this down. Now all your forests and planes can do whichever you want them to. Next we have Lightning Greaves. Standard EDH staple. Get that haste and shroud. The zero equip cost really makes this one. Phyrexian Processor is a really fun card combined with the commander of this deck as well as several other cards in here. Again, making use of those token doublers that we have. But when you play this card, it's four mana. You pick X amount of life. And in a 40, 40 life format, you can make that pretty high. Depending on the life gain you've already gained, you might even be able to go above that. I've had it up to some really stupid amounts before. So after you put this in play, you put the uh, whatever you paid for X on there. You're going to pay for, tap this. You're going to put an XX black minion creature onto the battlefield, where X is the amount of life that you paid when you cast this. Now combine this with our commander. She's in play. Every time a creature enters the battlefield, you're going to get back the amount of life equal to its toughness. So you can spend 30 on this, pay for, tap it, throw out a 30-30 uh, creature, and immediately gain that 30 life back and do it again every turn for four mana. Becomes really sick combo late in the game, even early on if you can get the commander out before you do this, which she only costs four mana too. It shouldn't be that hard. And uh, just a really sick combo between the two. Next we have a soul ring, another staple in commander. One mana to drop an artifact that taps for two mana. Can't go wrong with it. Next we have advent of the worm. This one's kind of an iffy. I, I may cut it, I may not. I'm not positive on it. Four mana for a 5-5 five, five Trampler isn't that bad. It is a token creature. It is an instant speed, which is really nice because it lets you play it when people aren't expecting. Throw that out there. With our token doublers, you can actually get multiple ones of them. 
can uh, be a surprise to someone who attacks you when they think you're open and suddenly you have a bunch of 5-5 five, five blockers. But being that it's a single-use card that only puts out a single token if you don't have any multipliers out there, it's kind of the weak point of the, uh, of the deck. Though that instant speed's really what keeps it around for me. Next we have Epic Struggle. It's a great one I actually happened across on accident. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you have 20 or more creatures, you win the game. Kind of a cheesy win condition and a deck that can dump out so many tokens in a single turn. But it gives you another option in there. Next we have From Beyond. This is a newer addition to the deck. It's basically another Awakening Zone. This one gives you a 1-1 one, one Eldrazi Skyon instead of the 0-1 uh, Eldrazi uh, Spawn. It has a second ability where you can pay one and a green to sacrifice it and go look for an Eldrazi card put it in your hand. I don't think there are any Eldrazi in this deck. It's really just there for the uh, token production. Next we have Martial Coup. It's another massive token producer. You put X11 white soldier creatures on the token. If X is more than 5, it destroys all other creatures. So it also can be used as a board wipe. Costs 2 white and X. If you got the mana laying around, you can use it to just produce tokens. You can use it to wipe a board. You have to be careful, though, because if you use that 5 or greater, it also wipes your board. It's all other creatures, so keep that in mind. Still nice to have. Primal Vigor is one of those enchantments that are kind of hit or miss, depending on the way the board and the uh, game is going. It's basically another doubling season, except that this affects every player at the table. So you really have to be kind of thinking about the, the bigger picture when you put this in play. It does double the number of tokens that come into play for anyone at the table, and also doubles the number of plus one, plus one counters that would be placed on any creature on the table. So you have to keep that in mind, that it's going to help your opponents as much as you. On the same note, this one usually doesn't get the same amount of hate that doubling season does when it comes into play. Because it's helping everyone, it's more of a group hug type thing. And some players, especially if they're running plus one, plus one counters or tokens of their own, may let you keep this around a bit longer just so they can make use of it as well. Kind of puts less of a target on your head than doubling season. Last, we have uh, Sylvan Offerings. This is a really fun one. X and green. Choose an opponent. You and that player each put one XX green tree folk creature into the battlefield. Then you get to choose another opponent can be the same one even if you if you want. And uh, you and that player each put X11 green elf warriors onto the battlefield. So you're giving one person a really big XX green tree folk and somebody else a bunch of little 11s. At the same time you're getting both yourself. Combined with all of our doublers, it really doesn't matter that you're giving them tokens. At least in my opinion, there are so many other ways to uh, compensate for it. And it kind of uh, lowers the, the threat meter of yourself as you're giving other people creatures. So it's kind of a, a trade-off. Although you can also piss off if you're playing like a four-person pod and you choose the guy to your left for one, the guy to your right for one, the guy across from you is probably not going to be too happy with you. So it's an interesting card. gives you a lot of options on uh, what you can do. For our creatures, this deck's actually surprisingly light on creatures for the amount of tokens it puts out. Most of these are token producing creatures and most of our spell cards were uh, sorceries and instants were all token producing as well. Start off here with the Armada Worm. Basically it's a pair of 5-5 five, five worms with trample. Again with our doubling cards out there you get multiples of that token when it comes into play which are nice. Next we have Geist Honored Monk. This one's another one that's kind of slow, not that great in here. It's one of them that might be uh, cut. At the same time, it is one of our biggest creatures, possibly. Gives you that uh, XX, where X is the number of creatures that you control, and uh, has Vigilance. He also puts two 1-1 one -one Spirit Tokens with flying into the battlefield when he enters. So in the very least, if you just cast him, he's a 3-3, three -three, and he can grow from there. And all of our doublers and our other tokens will bump them up pretty high. Next we have Rampaging Bayloth. Pretty much another decent staple in, in any green deck. 6-6 six, six Trampling Creature for 6 mana. Pretty standard. The Landfall ability is what really pushes them over the top. Every time a land enters the battlefield under your control, you get another 4-4 four, four Beast token. Voice of Resurgence. Everybody out there probably already knows what this card is. Basically protection on your turn from your opponents. 
If an opponent casts a spell during your turn when this creature's on the battlefield, you actually get a uh, big elemental token that has uh, power and toughness equal to the number of creatures you control. Definitely a nice one to have around if you're playing against people who are playing blue or have weird combo decks or things that r will trigger on your turn. Makes them think twice about triggering that than uh, giving you those tokens, especially if you have your, your token doublers in play. Next we have a veteran war leader. It's another power and toughness equal to the number of creatures you control. He has a second ability too, involves allies. We don't have really any allies in this deck. He's there just to be a, a big stompy creature when the time arises. Unless you've been playing Magic for a while, these might not be too familiar with you. Maybe playing Commander probably seen flip cards like these. This one starts out for two mana. You get a 2-1 uh, creature that has an ability to tap him, put a land from your hand into the battlefield. If you control 10 or more uh, lands, you flip him. When you flip him, he becomes a 3-3 three, three creature that has uh, pay 4 and 2 green. Tap it to put an XX green elemental on the battlefield, where X is the number of lands you control. Another nice one to put out some big creatures if you can get them up there. If you play them mid-game or so, it doesn't take that long to get 10 lands out in a game of Commander. Next we have Karametra, the god of the harvest. One of those interesting, uh, comes out as an enchantment if your devotion is high enough, becomes a creature. It's indestructible, and whenever you cast a creature spell, it lets you search your library for a forest or plains and uh, put them in the battlefield tapped and then shuffle your library. It lets you get a lot of ramp in quickly. Five mana is pretty reasonable for what it does, and it becomes that 6-7 creature when your uh, devotion to green and white becomes seven or more. Next we have Reese the Redeemed. It's a really nice uh, combo with everything else we have in the deck. For two and a green or white, you can tap him and put a green and white Elf Warrior into play. Nothing spectacular, but again, it does combo with our doubling cards. For four and two green or white, you tap him. And for every creature token that you control, you can put a copy of that token. So basically doubles the number of creature tokens you have. That's where the uh, real effect comes in. This combines with a couple other cards that are actually on my maybe board right now. I took it out. I had uh, Illusionist Bracers in here, which worked really well with him. So there's a limited number of cards in the deck that it also works with, but it may be something I add back in later. Next we have Wiltleaf Liege. This one's four mana, basically. You're getting a 4-4 four, four that gives all other green creatures plus one plus one and all other white creatures plus one plus one helps pretty much every creature in the deck except for those couple black minions we can make from our artifacts other than that if a spell or an ability that an opponent controls is going to make you discard him you get to play him for free next we have amara tandris little steep casting cost seven mana. i think it's, it's the highest costing creature in the deck uh probably the highest costing card in the deck other than crush of worms 5-7, not the greatest stats in the world for the amount of mana you're paying, but the ability that prevents all damage that's dealt to creature tokens you control makes your tokens become just the most disgusting blockers in the world, and combined with other cards that we have that make them also indestructible, just a very, very nice card to have in there, if a little expensive mana-wise. Sucks if you draw it early on, but late game, she's definitely nice to have. Next we have Mitotic Slime. This one used to be a favorite of mine in my mono green deck. I've since replaced it with some bigger stuff, but in a token and doubling deck, he's really good. It's basically a 4-4 creature for 6, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when he dies, he splits into two 2-2 two, two greens uh, oozes. And then when those die, they each split into two 1-1 one, one green oozes. So by the end, you get two 2-2s two, or 4-1-1s four, four, or one, ones by the end. And uh, combine that with our doubling cards, and they just spawn out of control. Make great blockers just to chump block with to split them into more pieces. Next we have Trastani Summoner. It's another one that's got a really high casting cost for what it does. A lot of people don't really like it because it's so weak itself and the ability isn't the greatest. But in this deck with our token doubling, it really does fit well. It's another one if you draw early on, it absolutely sucks, but late game she becomes really disgusting. I love the uh, promo, promo card here with the slightly different artwork on it. When she enters the battlefield, you're going to get her, who's a 1-1. Then you're going to get a 2-2 white knight creature with vigilance. 
You're also going to get a 3-3 three, three centaur creature. And you're also going to get a 4-4 four, four rhino with trample. So you're getting a 1-1, one, one, a 2-2, two, two, a 3-3, three, three, and a 4-4 four, four for 7 mana. Still, like I said, not a huge powerful card. But at the same time, with all of our doublers in play, that's where it really becomes disgusting. Because you're going to have multiples of all those tokens. Worm Coil Engine is just another really good card all around. But also plays well with our token theme here. 6 mana for a 6-6 six, six has Death Touch and Life Link. The really cool thing about him is when he finally does get killed, he's going to split in half and he becomes a 3-3 three, three Life Link and a 3-3 three, three Death Touch Worm. And again, with our doublers, you can put out multiples of those, which become really disgusting. And so we have Ant Queen, pretty much a staple in most green decks in Commander, uh, especially in anything running tokens. 5 mana for a 5-5. Five, five. Not anything spectacular, but that uh, ability that you can dump multiple times into, depending on how much mana you have laying around, puts those 1-1 one, one insect creature tokens on the battlefield for 2 mana. Definitely a, a nice card. Even early on, it's not too bad. 5 mana is pretty easy to come by. Felidar Sovereign's another alternate win condition in here. I think it's a really cheesy card in Commander, but I've had it played against me so many times, I finally threw one in here. Six mana means you're not going to get it till later on. Vigilance, lifelink, four, six. Not a hugely powerful creature. He becomes a decent defender. It's that ability that at the beginning of your upkeep, if you have 40 or more life, you win the game. In a format where you start with 40 life, in a deck that's built around just gaining massive amounts of life, it becomes really stupid. The uh, trick is to keep him alive for the turn so that he's still on the battlefield during your upkeep. Because once people see him on the battlefield, see your life total, everybody's going to turn on you to, very, in the very least, get rid of him, if not get your life down. I know I'm going to pronounce this one wrong, but it's the uh, Mycoloth. This thing is absolutely disgusting and broken in anything that generates any sort of tokens, especially massive amounts. It's a 4-4 four, four creature for 5 mana. He has Devour 2. Which basically lets him, uh, set, you can sacrifice any number of creatures that you want. So you sacrifice a bunch of your 0-1s, 1-1s, all your tiny little tokens to him. For every one you sacrifice, he gets 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters. That alone is really disgusting. Add on top of that things like Doubling Season and Primal Vigor, which are going to double those amount of counters. Already, he's a disgusting creature on his own. But then the second ability comes into play, where at the beginning of your upkeep, if he's on the battlefield... You get a 1-1 one, one green sapling creature for every plus one plus one counter that's on him. And then again, those also trigger off of our doubling cards to put out stupid amounts. So, if you sacrifice 10 small tokens, you're already putting 20 counters on him, even without any doubling out there. And then every turn, you're going to put out 10 more guys, so you're just going to replace the very first turn. You're going to replace everything that he devoured, and then some. So, just an all-around good card. Next, we have the Vito Ghazi Guild Mage. Another one that's not spectacular for what it does. Two mana for a 2-2. Two, two. It's not bad. The abilities are a little pricey on it mana-wise. For four, a green and a white, you can put a 3-3 three, three centaur creature on the battlefield. Very overcosted for what that ability does. Unless you have the doublers in play, you're probably never going to use that ability. The second one's a little bit more useful. Two mana, a green and a white, to populate. That lets you choose any of your tokens that you have in play put out a copy of them. Comes into play really nice with some of those XX elemental creatures we can put into play, our XX minion creatures from our artifacts, or even the 8-8s that you get from the uh, one land we have. Next we have Hilliod, God of the Sun. Four mana for a 5-6, indestructible is already a good call. He starts off as an enchantment till your devotion gets to five, and then he becomes a creature. He gives all your other creatures vigilance, which includes all your tokens and all your regular creatures, which is very nice. And he also has an ability for two and two white to put a 2-1 uh, white cleric enchantment creature onto the battlefield. Again, another one that we can double and, and so on from there. Next we have our Avenger of Zendikar. All around superb creature if you're playing green no matter what. In a token deck, it's just stupidly good. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a great target for the Soul Foundry and the Mimic Vat. That every time you uh, play these, you're getting that Enter the Battlefield effect that gives you the 0-1 uh, plant tokens for every land you control. Being that he costs 7 mana, you're already going to have at least 7 lands laying around, so there's your tokens right there. 
and then he has landfall on top of that. Every time it land enters the battlefield while he's in the battlefield, you're going to gain a plus one, plus one counter on each of your plant creatures. Next we have the giant Ataphage. This one's kind of hit or miss. I like it. I played it in my mono green stompy deck. Seven mana for a seven seven trampler. It's a decent value there for the card. The ability is that uh, whenever he deals combat damage to a player, you get a copy, a uh, token copy of him. And that's really what he's here for is to get those token copies of him and then double those tokens with our other abilities. One of the slower creatures in the deck, but 7-7 seven, seven Trample. He can definitely be useful, especially once you get multiples of those in play. Then you start attacking with multiples of them and they can't just chump block with them because the damage is going to trample through and then you're going to get the multiples from each of the tokens and they just multiply. Requiem Angel is another really interesting card that fits really well with this deck. Six mana for a 5-5 five, five flyer is steep, but the ability more than makes up for that. Whenever another non-spirit creature you control dies, you get a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying. So the tokens themselves it produces can't multiply and trigger itself, but pretty much everything else in the deck uh, it can. I think there's only one other thing in the entire deck that produces spirits. So any of your creatures, any of your tokens that die, you're going to get more tokens back. Next we have Wayfaring Temple. Really nice card no matter what point you're in of the game. He gets a power and toughness equal to the number of creatures you control. So in the very least he's a 1-1 for 3 mana, which is kind of steep. But at the same time, he's going to grow super quickly as our tokens come into play. He also has the ability is whenever he deals combat damage to a player, you get to populate, which lets you make copies of, the, of uh, tokens. Champion of Lamholt's another pretty good card all around for green. Super good in a token deck where you're going to be putting out massive amounts of creatures. Every time a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you're going to put a plus one, plus one counter on her. Again, combines well with a bunch of our other cards that are going to either double those counters or add extra counters also when creatures enter the battlefield. The real, really nice thing about her is that creatures with a power less than her power can't block creatures you control. So if you get a ton of tokens put on her through doubling season, through our uh, various enchantments that put tokens on things, through her own ability and so whatnot, Eventually, all of your little token guys are going to become unblockable creatures. Even starts out right from the beginning. Those little 1-1s one -one suddenly become a lot more threatening when you have 20 of them and they're all unblockable. Next, we have Kazandu Tuskcaller. It's another small creature, good early on. Late game, you can throw her out and level her up really quick. Starts out as a 1-1, one -one, stays that way throughout the whole thing. Once you get her to level 2, you can tap her to put a 3-3 elephant on the battlefield. Once you get her to level 6... You can tap her to put two 3-3 three, three green elephants on the battlefield. Again, multiplies with all of our various cards to really get out a large number of those rather quickly. Sarah Ascendant's kind of an oddball in this deck. I think it's the only thing in here that doesn't have some sort of token type ability or make use of them. But in a white deck, it's kind of silly not to have one. A 1-1 one, one life linker for one that uh, turns into a 6-6 six, six flying life linker if you have 30 or more life. In a game where you already start with 40 life, in a deck that's built around gaining life, you're probably not going to be below 30 unless you're in a really bad situation. So you're going to get that 6-6 six, six flying lifelink for one mana. It's an amazing draw on the first turn of the game, and uh, only gets more useful as things go on. Like I said, one card in here that doesn't make token production, but definitely has its own use. Lastly here we have the Wolfbriar Elemental. It's kind of a fun one. 4 mana for a 4-4, four, four. has a multi-kicker of 1 green, and uh, when he enters the battlefield, you get a 2-2 two, two wolf for every time he was kicked. If you have a bunch of green mana laying around, you can dump it all into him and just put out a, a wall of wolves. Last, we have our commander here, Tristani Selesnia's voice. We've already gone over a bunch of the combos in this deck that go trigger off of her, but 2 white, 2 green for a 2-5. She's not the most powerful commander in the world, but her abilities really help to make this deck shine. Her first ability is whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you gain life equal to that creature's toughness. With the amount of tokens that we can put into play and the size of the tokens that we can put into play, those toughness numbers kind of add up really quickly, and you're going to be gaining stupid amounts of life, especially combined with things like the Phyrexian Processor. Her second ability is a uh, pay one a green and a white to populate 
not quite as useful as the first one, but definitely a, a nice thing. The downside is it taps her, so you can only use it once a turn. But at the same time, this is a, probably the only other really good card in here to combine those Illusionist Bracers, which I have in my baby board to add. There's a couple other creatures in there. I may put them back, but uh, let you basically do that ability twice. Anyway, that's it for my uh, Selesnya Commander deck. This one's probably, like I said, my, my second most fun deck that I enjoy playing. And uh, if you have any comments or questions, you want to see what kind of cards I want to, I'm thinking about adding or swapping in, you can take a look at my tapped out deck list. I'll link it down in the notes. And uh, let me know what you think, and I'll see you in the next video.